Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, The Ridge. I formerly used a leather wallet and I would pack it full of junk. It got to be so full that I couldn't even sit on it comfortably, so I'd take it out and leave it beside me. This became a major headache when I left it on a train one day. Luckily, that time I got my wallet back, minus the $60 I had in it. But now, that isn't something I worry about because I use a Ridge wallet. They have a sleek, minimalist design so it's easy and comfortable to carry in any pocket. Ridge wallets look so much cooler than leather wallets. They have dozens of designs so you'll probably find one that you'll love. I'm not the only one who loves Ridge wallets. They have over 30,000 5 star reviews. Right now the Ridge is offering criminally listed viewers 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. Just go to ridge.com slash listed, that's ridge.com slash listed, and use the promo code listed at the checkout. Treat yourself to the best wallet you'll ever own and you'll be supporting criminally listed in the process by checking out rich.com slash listed. Number 3. Teresita Bassa Teresita Bassa was born in 1927 on an island in the Philippines. She graduated from a college in Manila and then she moved to Bloomington, Indiana to attend the University of Indiana. She got her master's degree in music from the university. She then studied inhalation therapy in Chicago, Illinois. In early 1977, Bassa was working at the Edgewater Hospital in Chicago. Bassa was also enrolled at Loyola University where she was working on her doctorate in music. Bassa also gave piano lessons in her apartment. Bassa didn't drink or do drugs. She dated, but she never got married. In fact, at the age of 49, Bassa was still a virgin. On February 21, 1977, the fire department was called to Bassa's apartment building. There was a fire at Bassa's 15th floor apartment. When the fire department got into the apartment, they found a mattress in the middle of the living room on fire. The firefighters looked around the apartment and it didn't appear that anyone was inside of it. They lifted the mattress and they found the dead body of 49 year old Teresita Bassa. She was nude and a butcher knife was embedded in her chest. According to the autopsy, Bassa had not been raped. The police were called in and they looked around the apartment. It had been ransacked but they did not think that anything had been stolen. They found a note that Bassa had written which read, Get theater tickets for AS. The police were baffled by the crime scene. They could not figure out who would want to kill Bassa. For five and a half months, the case sat cold. Then in August, a couple, Dr. Jose Chawa and his wife, Remy Bias, who went by the name Remy, contacted the police. The Chawas, like Bassa, were from the Philippines. Jose was a surgical assistant at a hospital in Chicago. Remy was an inhalation therapist at the same hospital as Bassa. Remy knew Bassa, but they worked on different shifts, so they didn't know each other well. At first, the couple was hesitant to talk to the police. When the lead detective interviewed them, they even came across as embarrassed. Jose then asked the detective if he believed in possession and the occult. The detective said he was open-minded about such subjects. Then Remy started to relay a strange story. Remy said that one night she was in a lounge in the hospital and she was lying down for a quick nap. She said that after she closed her eyes, she felt a ghostly presence in the room. She opened her eyes and she saw what she said was the ghost of Teresita Bassa. Remy said that the vision didn't say anything to her, it just stared at her. 
Remy said she was terrified, so she started praying, and then the ghost went away. Jose had a story of his own. Jose said that about two weeks later, he and Remy were sitting in their living room. Suddenly, Remy got up and went into their bedroom to lay down on the bed. He went to check on her, and she started talking to him in Tagalog, which is a language used on some Filipino islands and is the basis of the Filipino language. But she spoke with a slight Spanish accent. Remy said she was Teresi de Bassa. Supposedly, through Remy, Bassa said she was home alone on the night of the murder. At about 7 p.m., her friend, Alan Showery, came to her apartment and she let him in. He then stabbed her in the chest. Jose said that his wife was in a trance for about half an hour and then she woke up. Remy said she didn't even remember leaving the living room. The couple did not think that anyone would believe them, so they kept quiet. Then, a short time later, Remy went into another trance. Supposedly, through Remy, Teresita Bassa asked Jose to go to the police. She said that Chowry had stolen a ring from her. It was a pearl cocktail ring. In her trance, Remy said that Chowry had given the ring to his girlfriend or his wife. Once again, the Chawas didn't feel comfortable going to the police. It was only after Remy went into a trance for a third time that they decided to contact the police. They thought that the detective was going to be skeptical of them. But the detective thought that what they said was interesting. The existence of the note that read, Get theater tickets for AS had never been made public. When the detective initially read the note, he thought it indicated that someone with the initials AS was going to stop by Bass's apartment on the evening that she was murdered. The suspect that the Chawas gave him, Anthony Showery, had the initials AS. The detective also didn't know that anything had been stolen from the apartment. According to the Chawas, some of Bass's jewelry had been stolen. The detective decided to investigate Anthony Showery. Showery was a respiratory technician at the hospital where Bass and Remy worked. It turned out that he lived close to Bassa. According to several of Bassa's co-workers, Showery was supposed to go to Bassa's apartment on the night she was murdered to repair her TV. The detective brought Showery in for questioning. At first, Showery denied going to Bassa's apartment. But after some questioning, he admitted that he did go to her apartment but they left because he didn't have the proper tools. He said that she was alive when he left and he never went back to her apartment. The detective then questioned Shari's living girlfriend. He asked her if Shari had given her any jewelry after February 21st. She said that in late February, he gave her two pieces of jewelry as late Christmas gifts. One was an emerald brooch, and the other was a pearl cocktail ring. Friends and family of Bassa were shown the jewelry, and they said it belonged to Bassa. Shari was confronted with this information, and he confessed to killing Bassa. He said that after he left her apartment, he came back a short time later, and she let him in. When she turned her back on him to lock the door, he attacked her. He said he tried to make the crime scene look like a sex crime to cover up the robbery. On August 11th, 1977, Shari was charged with Bass's murder. In January 1979, Anthony Shari went to trial, but it ended in a mistrial. The jury had deliberated for 13 hours, and they were hopelessly deadlocked. Supposedly, the jury was evenly split. 
In February 1979, Chowdhury pleaded guilty to murder and armed robbery. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. He was paroled in 1983. Including the time Chowdhury served while he was awaiting his trial, he did about six and a half years for the cold-blooded murder. After the murder, which was dubbed the voice from the grave case, Anthony Showery stayed out of the news. His current whereabouts, and if he is still alive, is unknown. Number 2. John Hardin Claremont is a small city in Florida. It is about 22 miles from downtown Orlando. The city was established in 1885. A year later, a big white Victorian house was constructed at the corner of what is now 5th Street and Osceola Street. In 1974, John Hardin, his wife, Victoria, and their 9-month-old son moved into the home. Victoria had inherited the house. The family had previously lived in Jacksonville, Florida. John's former wife and the four children that he had with her remained in Jacksonville. In Claremont, John ran a commercial refrigeration company. On the night of March 22, 1975, John got a call from the owner of a drive-in restaurant in Groveland, which is a city that is about five miles from Claremont. The owner needed a piece of equipment repaired. John, Victoria, and their son all went to the restaurant together. They returned home at about 10.45 p.m. When they got home, Victoria put the baby to bed, then she went to bed herself. John hopped in the shower. After John got out of the shower, he saw that his truck was on fire. He told Victoria to get their son out of the house in case the fire spread. The house had two staircases. John ran down the stairs at the back of the house that led to the kitchen. He then went out the back door to the back porch. Along the way, he grabbed a fire extinguisher. He then tried to put out the fire. As Victoria was getting her son out of the house, she heard what she thought was a loud explosion. She thought that the truck had exploded. It turned out that John had been shot once in the chest with a shotgun. The fire and the sound of the gunshot aroused the attention of some of the neighbors. They came over and tried to put out the fire and help John. Victoria tried to call 911 when their phone line had been cut. It's believed that was cut while they were on the service call at the restaurant. John was eventually taken to the hospital. Sadly, the 32-year-old father of five died about an hour after he was shot. The police searched the property and they found a 20-gauge shotgun in the bushes. It's believed that the killer was hiding in the bushes and the family could have walked by him or her when they got home. After the family went inside, the killer started the fire to lure John outside. He or she then shot him and fled. No one saw the shooter. It's suspected that the killer went two blocks to a boat ramp on Lake Mineola. He or she could have easily escaped in a rowboat without anyone noticing. The police have several theories about who killed John Hardin, but no arrests have ever been made in the case. Victoria Hardin never spent another night in the house. In March 1978, the Ferris family moved into the house. At the time, they did not know it was the site of an unsolved murder that happened three years earlier. When the matriarch, June Ferris, first saw the house, she claimed she recognized it from a recurring dream that she had been having for years. In her dreams, she would get out of bed and go down the back stairs. For some reason, June knew that there was another staircase 
but she always went down the stairs at the back. She would go through the kitchen and out to the porch. Then she would wake up. Not long after the Ferris family moved in, they noticed strange things happening around the house that they couldn't explain. For example, one day shortly after they moved in, the hitch of a boat trailer was resting on a sawhorse. Several times, when no one was around, the hitch would lift off the sawhorse and land on the ground. One night, while everyone was asleep, June's adult daughter, Robin, and her husband heard music playing in one of the rooms. They went into the room and they found several music boxes playing music. No one in the house had turned them on. Another night, Lori, another one of June's daughters, was in the house with her boyfriend, Bob. They heard the back door open and close, and then they heard some heavy footsteps heading towards the room where they were watching TV. When no one came into the room, they investigated the noises and found no one there. One day, Robin felt a chill go through her as she was walking up some stairs. She compared it to the feeling you get when you open the door of a freezer on a hot day. She said that she then saw the ghost of a man who was in his early 30s. June had a grandson who lived in the house. He reported seeing the ghost as well. The ghost would watch over him as he slept. He woke up several times and saw the ghost. The family was convinced that the house was haunted. In October 1985, June's daughter's boyfriend, Bob, did some research and he learned about John Hardin's murder. The family was sure that it was his ghost haunting the home. June also realized that there was a connection between her recurring dreams and the murder of John Hardin. In June's dreams, she followed the same path out of the house that John did on the night that he was murdered. When John's ex-wife heard about the haunting, she said it was possible. She said that John had always been protective of his children and he would often check in on them while they were sleeping. She thought that this was similar to what the ghost did when he would watch over the child as he slept. She thought that the ghost was simply checking on the child. In 1990, the Ferris family sold the house to Ken and Donna Hatley. The Hatleys also noticed strange things happening in the house. They would hear footsteps in the hallway when no one else was there and other strange sounds. In 1990, not long after the Hatleys moved in, the television show, Unsolved Mysteries, did a segment on John Hardin's murder and the supposed haunting. While they were filming, the production team noticed strange things that happened in the house. Doors would open on their own. Their equipment would fail without explanation. Lights would flicker on and off. Finally, an attic window inexplicably shattered. Donna Hadley said that the strange happenings around the house stopped in 1992. The murder of 32-year-old John Hardin remains unsolved. After 45 years, unless someone comes forward, it is likely that the murder will never be solved. Number 1. The Canic Chase Murders Bluxwich is a market town in England's West Midlands. On the evening of December 1st, 1964, nine-year-old Julia Taylor was walking by herself in the town. A man in a car pulled up to Julia and told her that he had been sent by her aunt to pick her up. He called himself Uncle Len. He told her he was going to take her to Bentley to pick up some Christmas gifts. Julia got into his car. The man drove her to an isolated area, a Canic Chase. 
Canic Chase is a 90 square mile nature preserve between Stafford and Birmingham. The man sexually assaulted Julia and strangled her. He then dumped her body in a ditch and drove off. Julia regained consciousness a few hours later and she started crying for help. A cyclist who happened to be passing by heard her cries and he got her help. Julia couldn't recall much about her attacker. She thought he drove a car that was painted two different colors. A person who saw Julia get into the car thought that the car was a Vauxhall Cresta. The witness also remembered that the car had a unique feature. There was a spotlight affixed to the driver's side door. Unfortunately, no one was arrested for the attack. Nine months later, on September 8, 1965, six-year-old Margaret Reynolds walked home from school for lunch. Margaret lived in Aston, which is a ward of Birmingham. Aston is about 12 miles from Blockswich. After Margaret ate her lunch, she left her house to walk back to school by herself. Tragically, she never made it to school. When she didn't return home, her frantic parents called the police. The police thought that Margaret had just gone lost and she would turn up at any time. The next morning, when she still had been found, the police conducted a massive search for her. 150 officers were involved in the search and they went door to door. Over 25,000 people were interviewed. Margaret was a month shy of her seventh birthday when she went missing. Her birthday passed and no trace of her had been found. Nearly four months later, on December 30th, 1965, at around two in the afternoon, five-year-old Diane Tiff left her grandmother's home in Blockswich. She was supposed to walk a short distance to her own home, but she never made it there. A house-to-house -house search was started. By New Year's Day 1966, 500 officers were looking for Diane. On January 12, 1966, a man was hunting for rabbits in Canuck Chase. He was walking beside a ditch that ran along a farmer's field. In the ditch, he found the dead body of a young girl. She was identified as Diane Tift, who went missing two weeks earlier. Under her body was another set of human remains. They were severely decomposed. The remains were later identified as Margaret Reynolds, who went missing four months earlier. An autopsy was performed on Diane's body. It appeared she had been sexually assaulted. The medical examiner thought that the killer pulled her hood over her head and then he put his hand over her nose and mouth and suffocated her. Margaret's remains were too severely decomposed so an autopsy couldn't be performed. Unfortunately, the police did not find any clues that led them to the killer. It wasn't long before the cases went cold. Eight months later, on the afternoon of August 16, 1966, 10-year-old Jane Taylor was riding her bike in the village of Mobberley. She vanished without a trace. Before Jane went missing, several people saw a gray car parked in the area where she was riding her bike. Jane Taylor has never been found dead or alive. Mobberley is about 60 miles from Blockswich. What is interesting to note is that Jane was last seen riding her bike near Road A34. Road A34 is the blue line on this map. If you drive south from Auberly to Blockswich on A34, you'll pass Canuck Chase. If you keep driving south on A34, you'll reach Aston, where Margaret Reynolds was kidnapped. 
Also, the bodies of Margaret and Diane were found about half a mile from A34 in Canuck Chase. At around 2 p.m. on August 19, 1967, seven-year-old Christine Darby was playing with two friends in Walsall, which is about two miles from Blockswich. Walsall is also along road A34. It had been a year and three days since Jane Taylor vanished. A man in a car pulled up to them and asked if they knew the directions to Carmer Green, which is a shopping district in Walsall. They gave him the directions, but he said he didn't understand. He asked Christine to get in his car and show him how to get there. Then he'd come back and drop her off. Christine agreed and she got into his car. The boy she was playing with found it odd when the man drove in the opposite direction of Carmer Green. They had a bad feeling about what just had transpired so they ran to Christine's home and told her mother that she had gotten into a stranger's car. Her mother immediately called the police. One of the boys was able to describe the kidnapper. He said that he was a thin, white, clean-shaven man with brown hair. He thought he was between the ages of 35 and 40. He believed that the man was driving in Austin, Cambridge or Morris, Oxford. After the description was made public, several people called the police. They said they had seen a gray Morris, Oxford parked outside of a local school over the past two weeks. After Christine was missing for over 24 hours, the lead investigator thought that her body may be in Canic Chase. So the police started a search of the area. On August 20th, a pair of girls' underwear was found on a tree branch. They were identified as belonging to Christine. The next day, about two and a half miles from where the underwear was found, one of Christine's shoes was found. The day after that, which was August 22nd, 1965, Christine's body was found under some ferns. She was nude from the waist down. The local police knew that Christine had been killed by the same man who killed Diane and Margaret. So they called in Scotland Yard to assist in the investigation. An autopsy was performed on Christine and like Diane, she had been sexually assaulted and asphyxiated to death. The police asked for people who were in Canic Chase on the day Christine was kidnapped to come forward. Several people who contacted the police said that they saw a man in a grey Austin A60 not far from where the body was found. They described the man and it resulted in this sketch. But no arrests were made in the months after the murder. On the evening of November 4th, 1968, a man approached a 10-year-old girl in Walsall. The next day was Guy Fox Day, and the man asked the girl if she wanted to go see some fireworks. The girl initially said yes, but then quickly changed her mind. The man grabbed her by the arm, but she managed to break free and run away. The man then got in his car and drove off. A woman who witnessed the attempted kidnapping took note of the driver and the car. She noticed that the driver was wearing a unique wristwatch. It was silver and it had a silver bracelet attached to it. She said that the car was a cream and green Ford Corsair. She also gave the police what she thought was the license plate numbers. It turned out that she remembered all the letters and the numbers in the license plate, but she got the order wrong. Nevertheless, the police were able to track down the car. It belonged to a 39-year-old engineer named Raymond Morris. Morris lived in Walsall. He was married to his second wife, and he had two children. Morris was the foreman engineer at a precision instruments factory. 
The police immediately noticed that Morris resembled the sketch. They also learned they had previously owned an Austin A60. Not only that, but he had also owned a two-tone Vauxhall Cresta. The Vauxhall Cresta had a spotlight on the driver's door. It turned out that the police were already aware of Morris. After Diane Tift went missing, the police received a tip from Morris's brother. He said that Morris had some strange and disturbing sexual fantasies and he was in the area when Diane went missing. The police had investigated Morris, but he had alibis for the afternoons that Diane and Margaret were kidnapped, so he was dismissed as a suspect. In October 1966, Two girls, ages 10 and 11, reported that they had been lured to an abandoned building where a man took inappropriate photos of them. The police thought that man was Raymond Morris. However, the girls' stories did not coalesce with each other. Also, the police didn't find any evidence that Morris took photos of them. So he wasn't charged with anything. This information was never passed along to the investigators who were working on the Canuck Chase killings. On November 15, 1968, Raymond Morris was arrested for the murder of Christine Darby. After he was arrested, he refused to stand in a lineup. So the police came up with an idea about how they could get a witness to look at him. After Morris was arrested, he was being held in jail. While he was alone in the jail's yard, a witness who was in Canuck Chase on the day Christine was murdered was brought to the yard. He instantly identified Morris as the man he saw that day. The alibi Morris had given to the police for the afternoon of Christine's murder was that he was with his wife. Morris's wife collaborated his alibi and told the police he was with her all afternoon. After Morris was arrested, the police searched his home and they found an extensive collection of pornographic photos. They were photographs that Morris had taken himself. The girls in the photos were all incredibly young. One girl in several of the photos was Morris's wife's five-year-old niece. In many of the photos, there was also a man whose face you couldn't see. He was wearing a unique silver wristwatch that had a bracelet attached to it. The police searched Morris's home for the watch, but they couldn't find it. Morris's wife was shown the collection of photographs and then she was questioned again. She admitted that she wasn't with her husband on the afternoon that Christine was kidnapped and murdered. He came home about three hours after she was kidnapped. Morris's wife said she lied to the police because she couldn't possibly believe that her husband could do something so evil. Morris was subsequently charged with Christine's murder. Although Morris was the prime suspect in the murders of Margaret Reynolds and Diane Tift, he was not charged with those murders because the police did not feel like they had enough evidence. Also, at the time, Jane Taylor's disappearance had been not connected to the three Canuck Chase murders. After Morris was charged with the murder, he was sent to prison where he was strip searched. On his ankle, prison officials found a silver wristwatch with a bracelet attached to it. Raymond Morris went to trial in February 1969. He pleaded not guilty to killing Christine Darby and not guilty to attempting to kidnap the young girl on the night before Guy Fawkes Day. He did plead guilty to sexually assaulting his wife's five-year-old niece. Two witnesses testified that they saw Morris in Canuck Chase on the day Christine Darby was kidnapped and murdered. Morris's wife testified that she had lied for her husband to create an alibi for him for the afternoon that Christine was killed. 
Morris testified on his own behalf. He said that his wife was lying. He also said that the police had completely fabricated the case against him. As Morris was testifying, a young girl in the gallery started yelling. She shouted, That's him. That's the man who did it to me. It turned out that the girl was Julia Taylor, the first girl who was assaulted and left for dead in 1964. Raymond Morris was quickly found guilty by the jury and he was sentenced to life in prison. In 2001, Morris, who was still in prison after 32 years and was still maintaining his innocence, announced that he was going to appeal his conviction. He pointed out that there was no physical evidence that tied him to the murder. His appeal was filed in 2003, but it was ultimately denied. Raymond Morris died in prison in March 2014 at the age of 84. He had served 45 years of prison, making him one of Britain's longest serving prisoners. The police are sure that Raymond Morris killed Jane Taylor, Margaret Reynolds, and Diane Tift as well. They point out that after Morris was arrested, the Canuck Chase murder suddenly stopped. Since the early 1980s, there have been stories that Canuck Chase is haunted by a young girl with black eyes. Some people have said that while they were in Canuck Chase, they heard a girl scream and then they searched for her. They find a young girl, and when she looks at them, they see that her eyes are entirely black. She then runs into the woods and vanishes. Some people have even claimed that they have taken photos or recorded video of the black-eyed girl. For example, the television program Paranormal Truth claims that this video still contains an image of the black-eyed girl. Or there's this photograph, which was taken by a woman named Christine Hamlet, who claims she is a psychic. Or there's this photo, which was taken by a homemaker named Michelle Mason. She took the photo of her two sons and didn't realize until she reviewed the image that there's a ghostly face of a child in the picture. However, critics say that these are just illusions created by the lighting where the video or photographs were manipulated. But other people maintain that a girl with black eyes haunts the place where at least three young girls were brutally murdered. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, if you are looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The videos are mysteries that you can try and solve. Do you have what it takes to solve these mysteries? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.